this writer finds himself in the middle of a real-life horror story, instantly enjoys it. This one starts off with a scene of four people just hanging around, so I guess you can say this movie went straight for the kill. But that was just the prologue. The main movie starts with a family moving into a new house when a sheriff pulls up. Pretty normal day, right? Meanwhile, this couple has a daughter who likes to paint but doesn't like the new house. Red flag. Her dad, however, managed to convince her to try and like it, and if she still doesn't, after he sells his book, they'll move. That's right, he's a writer, pretty famous one. They make small talk about her painting and he reminds her of the first rule. She's not allowed to paint anywhere outside her room. She agrees, but of course she'll end up doing the exact opposite because kids just never listen. Anyway, the sheriff says it's only a friendly visit, but who refuses to shake their hand? Actually, given the current worldwide predicament, I guess it makes sense. Anyway, he tried to convince the famous pants writer to leave before he even settled in. Apparently, Ellison says a lot of bad things about the police and the sheriff doesn't like him anymore. Then we find out that Ellison, who's a true crime writer, moved here because of a missing girl whom he wants to write about. The sheriff insists she's rip in peace saying you could never explain something like this. But obviously, that only sounds like a challenge to Ellison. A challenge he'll eventually regret. Sheriff leaves and Ellison's wife is a little suspicious. So she asks, hey, we didn't move a few houses down from a crime scene again, did we? And he promises her they didn't. That's actually technically true and he'll defend himself with that technicality later on. They didn't move in a few houses from the crime scene. They moved into the crime scene. You can literally see the tree where the prologue happened from the kitchen. Anyway, Ellison goes up to the attic where he sees a scorpion and a box. He kills the critter, then opens the box and sees some really old tapes. He brings the box down and has dinner with his family. Pretty normal. Oh, and by the way, they have another child, a 12-year-old son with incredibly long hair. At the dinner table, they recite some more first rules. Kids say the first rule is never go into dad's room, and dad says the rule is always lock dad's room. Of course, nobody makes rules for the mom. She makes the rules. Dad and mom go off to their room, and mom is trying to convince dad to let go of writing true crime and go back to fiction. He promises he'll leave after one more hit, but you can nearly touch the tension in the air. Then boom, Tracy tells Allison that if this one goes sour like the last time, she'd take the kids and leave to her sister's place. That escalated quickly. He promises it won't go sour, but come on, man, who are you kidding? Anyway, Tracy is ready to sleep while Allison is off to his office to start work. First things first, let's try to figure out how the box of films got to the house. And to answer that, he watches the films. It's just the missing girl and her family playing around the trees and then hanging around again. Okay, that was just too much. He takes a little drink break and goes straight back to watching the same thing. He then writes two questions questions down on his notepad. He asks, who made the film? And, where's Stephanie? Before he turns the film off, he mutters, why would you film it? You would think that's enough ground covered for the night, but this guy is not lazy like me. He goes out to the crime scene to have a look for himself, but nothing happens, this time. He goes back into the house and doors are creaking everywhere. So, he follows the sounds and next thing, shadows are moving behind him, but it's only his daughter, this time. He tucks her in bed and promises her that he's going to write the best book that anyone has ever written. <laughs> no one's beating green eggs and ham, buddy. So, surely he goes back to bed now. Uh, no. He goes back to his office is watching another one of those films he found. We first see a pretty normal family out fishing and having a good time, but that quickly changes to a video of them taped and bound in a chained car, which was then set ablaze. What makes this crazier is that they seem to be alive when the car was set on fire, and no one thought to turn on the AC. Ellison is shaking at this point. He stops the film and calls the popo, but while the operator is trying to attend to him, he sees his books on the shelf and hangs up. What does he do next? He walks back to his bedroom, kisses his wife, and goes to sleep, right? No, he doesn't. He puts on another film in to watch. Why are you doing this to yourself, man? You know what? It's kind of like She-Hulk. It's so bad, but I just can't stop watching. Anyway, he hears a sound in the house that makes him stop the film. He thinks it's his daughter again, but it's not. She's fast asleep in her room. He's following the noises now, and he finds another box. This time, it's his son inside the box. What the? Okay, apparently he's having a night terror. He comes out screaming, and his dad carries him outside and calms him down. The demon in this movie wastes no time. The following morning at breakfast, the kid doesn't remember anything. Um, you scared everyone to death. How are you not gonna remember that? Anyway, it so happens that this is some sort of regular thing for little Trevor, because they once found him trying to pee in the dryer while he was asleep. Relatable. Anyway, the kids do a little sibling fighting over the dining table and they're off to school with their mom, leaving our Ellison alone in the house. I mean, is a movie really horror if there's no home alone scene? There's a Kevin McAllister joke in there somewhere, but I'm sure you'll miss it. Well, Ellison is back to watching the films and by now you can see a pattern. A happy family having a good time, this time around the pool, and then a quick cut to their gruesome demise. But our guy sees some strange creature in the pool, which frightens him and makes him turn off the film. But he almost immediately puts it back on and pauses on that creature. But as he moves closer to the screen, to focus on the creature. The film catches fire. Okay, guess it's now clear that we're dealing with some supernatural forces. Time to abandon this book, don't you think? But no. He quickly Googles how to edit Super 8 film and he gets to work ASAP. He's trying to retrieve the video when his family gets back. Mother and son arguing over what the boy did at school. So apparently, Trevor already has details about what his father is working on. And at school, he drew the picture of the four people hanging from a tree on the board with a permanent marker. No chill. As you would expect, the mother blames her husband for that and a small argument breaks out. It's really small though, as they seem 
and cool with each other by nighttime. Ellison is back working, watching a different film, and this time, we don't get a happy scene first. We go straight to a creepy scene and the gruesome demise of a few people whose hands and mouths have been taped. The person holding the camera gives everyone a throat massage, and Ellison needs a drink again. At this point, I think I need a drink too. Where did I put my gamer fuel? After a gulp, Ellison goes back to the video more slowly and carefully, looking for clues, and he finds a few. But while he's still following his leads, there goes that creaking noise on the roof again, this time immediately followed by a power outage. Perfect time to pack up and leave the house, I'd say. But Ellison decides to switch professions to electrician. He's walking around the house now with his only source of light being the flash from his phone. He hears a running noise up in the attic, and what does he do? He goes up there in the dead of night, in pitch darkness to confront the thing. White people in horror movies moment. The door banged shut after he got up there, and the scream he let out should have been enough to tell him that he was not built for this. But he kept going. This time around, he didn't see a scorpion. He saw a snake. And are we in Australia? There's too many things living in this house. Fortunately, the reptile wasn't hungry, so it went its own way while Elson found another clue. A drawn picture of the victims. He got what he needed, but he also got what he did not need. Some bruises on his leg from falling down the attic. After the leg was attended to by an emergency unit that had come around, there was a pretty awkward conversation between Ellison and the cop who showed up. Apparently the cop, deputy so-and-so, is a big fan who not only wanted an autograph, but also wanted to help with the book because he wanted to see his name on the acknowledgements page. Clown chaser detected. Well, Ellison decides he could maybe use some police assistance, so he asked deputy so-and-so to help him find the addresses of the other murderers. By the way, I'm not making up that name. That's what the deputy was called throughout the movie. So stop laughing at me. Anyway, so-and-so excitedly leaves with his new assignment, and Ellison goes back to his office, and finally, he takes a break from the films and engages in some good old narcissism by watching an old interview of his. In that interview, he says something significant. I'd rather cut my hands off than write a book for fame or money. Well, I think he's now going to look for a knife in the drawer to cut. Or not. Okay. He's now examining all the pieces of evidence he has and trying to find similarities. And he sort of does. Remember that strange creature from the pool? It seems they appear in every piece of evidence. While our guy is still on that, his daughter brings him his coffee and lingers at the door pretty strangely for a bit. Hmm, what's that about? Anyway, guess who calls? The deputy. He already found the addresses and one of them happened to ring a bell. No pun intended. While Allison is connecting the dots, the picture of strange creature guy on the laptop screen moved, but our guy didn't notice. What he noticed though was some strange hands that were around him while he was falling down the attic. For the umpteenth time, our guy is frightened and he closes his laptop. But did he take a break? No. Oh, he actually did. My bad. That's him cuddling with his wife in the next scene. Wholesome. But a noise of film rolling wakes him up and he goes into his office to find the prologue hanging video playing, but nobody was in the room. He then notices something moving in the bushes outside and he grabs a baseball bat to go confront this thing alone in the dead of night. I get that you're an alpha male, but why do you only pick the middle of the night to show your bravery? But good thing he went out when he went out, because it was his son out there in the bushes having another one of his night terrors. How cute. He brings him in and goes back for his bat, but he's confronted by a black dog, and we see an apparition of the first family behind him. He doesn't see it, though, which is good, because no one likes running into their neighbors. He runs back into the house and his freaked out wife is telling him to drop the book and they should all move back. Some really wise words from a really wise woman. Surprising. But of course, Ellison is not even considering that. He says he thinks he's onto something really big here and cannot stop now. I was expecting him to talk about how he's seeking justice for these families, but he's talking about potential movie deals, talk shows, awards, money, all that stuff. Sir, just go cut your hands off already. Anyway, he somehow managed to calm his wife down and convince her that it'll all be worth it. The next day, the deputy shows up at his front door with a file, and while Ellison is scanning through the file, deputy so-and-so is explained that he can tell that these different murders are connected, and he's now asking to be kept in the loop. Ellison agrees and lets so-and-so into his sacred office, and they're now discussing the case. What we learn is that in each of these events, the killer took out the entire family except a child which he took with him. EDP 445 moment. There's also a common symbol in every crime scene. Upon seeing the symbol, the deputy recommends that Ellison consults a professor who is an occult crime expert. Is that like astrology or tarot cards? Ellison agrees and then gives so-and-so the job of finding out where the drowning happened. Up next, movie time. As usual, a family having a nice time together. But this time, someone is recording them from outside the house. Next thing you know, we're on the grass following a lawnmower to the point where it meets a tied up body. This time, our guy is startled out of his seat. He takes a little walk, and for the first time, we see him light a cigarette while the professor FaceTimed him. The professor is dissecting the case with a certain swagger, and he says something about one of the symbols which is associated with the worship of a certain deity, the ghoul. How original, who apparently is an eater of children. How original. And if you remember, each one of these cases has a missing child. How? Okay, I'll stop. So, the professor's theory is that the ghoul needs the souls of human children to survive. While he's talking, Ellison has a sudden realization, but for just the second time in his life, he makes the wise decision of leaving everything and going to get some sleep. But yet again, he's woken up by the sound of the film playing by itself in the office. So he picks up his baseball bat and is walking around the house. While he's walking, a little girl with a weird looking face pops out from the dark and jumps back into the dark without Ellison noticing. Weird flex, but okay. Ghosts do the darndest things. He's still walking around the house when three more kids, two boys and a girl, all with similar looking faces pop out. But again, he doesn't notice them. What is the point of all this? Having found nothing or nobody, he decides to retire back to bed. But not without checking on his kids. He checks. They're on their beds and he leaves. Dad 
dad of the year, eh? Not really. One of the girls with the weird looking faces is scaring his daughter and telling her not to say a word, but he goes around locking the doors and windows like the monsters are not already in the house. Anyway, he sleeps off on the couch while we watch the sun rise. Pretty beautiful, can't lie. Next day, he has the deputy over and our guy's asking the cop if there was anything weird, like paranormal or metaphysical, about the family that used to occupy the house before him. So and so said no. Kinda rhymes. Anyway, Allison goes on to basically share with the cop what he has been experiencing at the house, and so and so tells him that the case is probably taking him to dark places. That, coupled with the stress, is probably making him see things. Ah uh, yes, the cliche horror movie rationalization. It's just in your head, bro. He advised Allison to touch grass, or maybe even just leave the house completely. Another really wise advice which our guy doesn't take. But after so and so leaves and Allison is typing up on his laptop, his wife calls him to come scold his daughter who had broken one of the many number one rules by painting on a wall outside her room. But then, he sees the painting and he just freezes. <laughs> While he's staring at the painting, his daughter offhandedly explains that she made the painting on a request of Stephanie, the little girl who used to live at the house. Do I need to say it? Of course, it starts a fight between the parents. Main reason being that the woman is just now realizing that they're living in a crime scene. Ellison tries to defend himself on the technicalities of how she asked her question. I told you he would do that. The argument goes on and on, and afterwards, and you should already know the drill, the man has to sleep on the couch. But we're dealing with a really considerate wife here. She goes to her husband and tells him to come to bed. While they're both there, a flash is being shown on Ellison's face and he wakes up right after after it goes off. He hears the tape rolling again, so he goes to check it out. He first goes to his office and finds out that his film player thing is gone, so he goes to the attic. Meanwhile, the staircase to the attic is down, so he just follows it up. What he sees in the attic shakes him to his very core. Five kids sitting on the floor with his film player thing projecting an image of the ghoul on the screen. Then it pops out from the screen and comes on, I mean, comes close to his face. Excuse the typo. He was so startled that he fell from the stairs. Then shortly after, the light goes out and the film player thing falls followed by a few tapes. And for maybe only the third time in this entire movie, Movie, Ellison makes the decision a normal human being would make. He finally decides he's had enough. He packs everything up, goes outside, and burns everything. His wife joins him and he admits that she was right all along. They should have never come here. It was time for them to leave. In the middle of the night, he gathers his wife and kids and skips town. On his way out, the same sheriff he met at the beginning pulls him over for speeding, and Ellison explains to him that he was leaving the town. And in their short conversation, Ellison revealed that there'd be no book. What a complete and utter waste of time. Awesome. Okay, wait a minute. Maybe not. The family has now moved back to their former home, and at night, Ellison faced times the professor after receiving some images from him. Those images include the scorpion and the snake our guy saw at the other house. They talk for a bit about the significance, then Ellison hangs up, deletes all the stuff he had gathered, and even emptied the trash. He's done for real. By the way, detective so-and-so has called about three or four times now, and our guy has declined each time. Uh-oh. He walks up to the attic in his house and sees a box like the one in the scary house. What's inside? Tapes. Of course, he's curious. Why wouldn't he be? He puts it together and is ready to watch it. But just before he does, detective so-and-so calls again and he finally answers. He had cracked it. Basically, all the families that were clapped had something in common. Each new victim had lived in the houses of the former victims. Then they each got clapped right after they moved. So wait a minute, going by that timeline, does that mean Ellison and his family are getting clapped next? Yes. Yikes. An unsuspecting Ellison watches the new tapes and here he can see the missing children all at the scenes of the crimes. They were the ones that made the others stop living. Just like his daughter is going to do in a bit. Yep, that sweet little girl took out her family and videotaped the whole thing. For TikTok. In the end, we see the ghoul appear and carry her into the film realm. The last thing we see is the neatly packed box in the attic and the ghoul's face popping up to try and scare me one last time. But you know, I'm built different. Stuff like that only scares beta males and people unsubscribe to this channel. Moral of the story, kids will do anything for TikTok.